Well, hello everyone and welcome to the SPWLA, The More You Know webinar series, sponsored by Green Imaging Technologies. The title of this webinar is Applications of NMR Diffusion and Profiling, presented by myself from Rice University and Gabriella Singer from Halliburton. The outline of our presentation, I'll start by presenting the prediction of permeability from diffusion T2 maps. Then Gabriella will present the roughness-free pore size from diffusion T2 maps. I will then finish with the saturation profiling for en enhanced oil recovery from spatially resolved T2 maps. So the first part is taken from a recent publication, which is a collaboration between Rice University and Vinegar Technologies. The motivation for this work, well, pore size, tortuosity, and permeability are important petrophysical quantities in low permeability unconventional formations, such as the organic rich chalks we are investigating. The traditional SDR and timber coats permeability rely on empirical scaling parameters whose default values do not work at, lower, at low permeabilities down at the 0.01 millidarcy and below range. So first, a little bit about the organic rich chalks uh, we're investigating. So the core samples we used uh, in this work are from the late Cretaceous Upper Garrett Formation in the Golan Heights. The matrix consists of microcrystalline calcites or micrite intermixed with high concentrations of organic matter as shown in the SEM image here. The Upper Garrett form Formation in this basin consists of organic rich bituminous foraminifera chalks. Uh, it's an early stage type 2S kerogen, as being the high sulfur content. Uh, these chalks are also tight with a horizontal permeability, Clinton-Burke corrected, of the uh, down to 0.017 millidarcy, a high to total organic carbon of 10 weight percent or 20 volume percent equivalently. Note also the high bitumen content and uh, that changes with depth. So we have two uh, depths of investigation, the 913 meter with around 3.7 PU bitumen and the slightly deeper 920 meter uh, with, which has more bitumen in it. Note also in the SEM image that the pore size is of the order of three microns according to the scale. And as I'll show you, this agrees with our uh, pad A fit of the uh, restricted diffusion data from NMR. So then a little bit about bulk diffusion. Here is an illustration of a bulk fluid, and we've tagged one molecule undergoing random walk during molecular diffusion. So D0 is the bulk diffusion coefficient. It's proportional to temperature over viscosity. Uh, T big delta is the diffusion evolution time, and that's a pulse parameter in the experiment that we choose. Now the free diffusion length is an important quantity. Uh, LD, it's given by the square root of D0 times T big delta, and it's the spatial extent of the random walk during diffusion evolution time T big delta. For a bulk fluid, the measured diffusion is equal to the bulk diffusion coefficient. So now what happens when we confine the fluid? So now we have an illustration of the pore fluid surrounded by grains, and uh, the pore body size D, and in this case, uh, we have restricted diffusion, restriction shown here, because the pore size is less than the diffusion length. And in that case, the measured diffusion is coefficient is much less than the bulk uh, diffusion coefficient. Note also that in NMR, we can determine this pore size uh, since pore size is proportional to T2. So how does this uh, diffusion look like in the uh, organic rich chalk we're investigating? So here's another illustration of that organic rich chalk. So we have the macritic calcite shown here uh, with water in it. We have uh, these grains are uh, coated by kerogen and bitumen as shown here. And then we have the light hydrocarbons, which uh, we want to produce uh, in red. Note again, the length scale around three microns. So one measurement in the short time regime where LD is chosen to be of the order of the pore size, you can see the random walk hits the, uh, the grains or the, the kerogen on the grains and uh, it's restricted. And by that sense, we get some information about the pore size. 
When we uh, extend that diffusion evolution time uh, in the long time regime, where the diffusion lengths are very long, much larger than the pore size, uh, the molecular diffusion uh, goes through all the pores and witnesses all the tortuosity of the porous medium, and we can extract the tortuosity of the porous medium. A little bit about our experimental setup. So we, uh, our NMR is from Oxford Instruments. It's a GSPEC-2, uh, resonates at 2.3 megahertz for hydrogen. The sample temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, we have an overburden cell. Uh, it's called the P5 cell, also from Oxford Instruments, which accommodates a one-inch core shown here. We apply confining stress to the core uh, using this manual pump with a Thurinert. And we apply a pore pressure using this ISCO pump uh, shown here. Now the fluids we, we use uh, are listed in this table and some of the properties at 30 degrees Celsius and the chosen pore pressure of 1,200 PSI. So one of the properties is the hydrogen index and that's uh, the density of hydrogens compared to water and of course the bulk diffusion coefficient. So water has a HI of one by definition and it's Diffusion coefficients are around 2.3. Heavy water is useful because it has no NMR signal or no hydrogen NMR signal. Methane, uh, its HI is low because at these conditions. However, its diffusion coefficient is very large. Uh, in that sense, we can uh, use that to probe large diffusion lengths. And the decane, uh, the alkane, uh, has a HI comparable to water and it has a lower diffusion coefficient. Uh, slightly lower than water, so that we can use decane to probe shorter diffusion lengths for the pore size. So here's an example of some uh, diffusion T2 data, and this is on the, the 920 meter uh, core uh, saturated with decane. So we have uh, T2 on the x-axis, on the y-axis is diffusion, and this is, uh, conditions are uh, for a fixed diffusion length of five microns. Uh, these lines here represent the horizontal dash line is the bulk diffusion coefficient for decane. And you can already see that the decane signal uh, is restricted compared to uh, the bulk decane. This diagonal dash line is known as the alkane correlation line. And what we also show are these projections. So on the top is the, the T2 projection, and on the right here is the diffusion projection. Now a little bit about this T2 projection. So the solid line is the projection of the 2D map, and the dashed is the full uh, 1D CPMG T2 signal. And you can see that the diffusion uh, cuts off the signal below what we call the dead time, T dead, which is around eight milliseconds. And that's due to the fact that the uh, diffusion encoding takes a certain amount of time and we cannot uh, basically lose all the T2 signals uh, that decay within that encoding time, uh, which is around eight milliseconds. Uh, the TE is the echo spacing of the 1D uh, CPMG T2. And uh, that's also a dead time uh, for the, uh, the T2 experiment. Now we can identify some of these fluids just by putting now some T2 cutoffs shown as the uh, vertical dash lines. So on the left here, the uh, short T2 is bitumen, or at least some of the bitumen, we can't measure all of it because of our limitations in TE. Uh, slightly longer T2 is the water and the macritic calcite. And then here to the right uh, is the light hydrocarbon region. Uh, these are the light hydrocarbons uh, we want to produce. Uh, the porosity here is uh, quoted as 27.6 PU1, and we, uh, we label it as PU11, saying that we've kept the hydrogen index equal to one, since this is a mixed saturated uh, signal. So uh, we next take that 2D map and we project the diffusion. Okay, so now uh, we're looking at just the light hydrocarbons region. Uh, what does that mean? Well, let's go back to this map. So we take all the signal to the right of this cutoff, and then we project its diffusion along here. Now the x-axis, the diffusion has been uh, divided by the bulk diffusion coefficient. So one here, the, the dashed line, is where bulk decay should be. 
But clearly, our uh, decade in the core is restricted by this amount. Now, this uh, dot here is actually the 2D peak of the uh, 2D map. And that diffusion value is the metric we'll use to analyze uh, uh, the pad A fit that I'll show you uh, shortly. So this is the diffusion for the single diffusion length. We then vary or increase the diffusion evolution time to get longer diffusion lengths. And we clearly see more and more restriction as that diffusion length increases. And from that decay, from that uh, decrease uh, in diffusion coefficient, we can get the pore size. Now let's look at the example of the same core, but saturated with methane. Now, before we saturated with methane, we uh, did some D2O exchange uh, with the core, and that basically got rid of most of the H2O signal that was in uh, this macritic water region and a little bit of residual water that was in the uh, light hydrocarbons region. The reason we do this for methane in this case is because the hydrogen index of C1 is low, so we want to make sure we don't have any interference from water here. So this is the data. Um, you can see the bulk uh, methane line is much higher than that of decane. And you can also see that the methane in the light hydrocarbons region is heavily restricted here. And this is all for a uh, diffusion length of 61 microns. So now we do the same thing. We take the signal to the right of this cutoff, just the hyd light hydrocarbons region, and we plot the diffusion projection shown here. And again, we plot the 2D peak uh, diffusion coefficient here, uh, which we believe is the best metric uh, for the system to uh, characterize the diffusion. So this is again for the 61 micron. Let's increase the diffusion length by increasing that diffusion evolution time. And we see more restriction as we increase that diffusion length. So how do we put all this data together? Well, here it is. We plot here on the y-axis the restricted diffusion. So that's D divided by D0 for both the decane data and the methane data as a function of the diffusion length. So with this data, we can then fit to the PADE fit. Now the PADE fit is a phenomenological fit which joins the short time to the long time regimes. And uh, we can get, uh, the, well, the PADE fit uh, has three uh, three parameters in it. It has the pore size, the tortuosity, and the heterogene heterogeneity length scale, LM. LM is something we're investigating to see uh, what physical meaning we can, we can uh, extract from it. Uh, a bit about the PADE fit. Well, it was um, first derived in this scenario by uh, Mitra et al. in 92. And in the short time regime, it has an explicit expression shown here. Uh, if we assume D are cylindrical pores, it takes on this form. Uh, if not, the, most, the more general form has a surface to volume ratio. And so basically from this initial slope, we can get the pore size, which is around 4.9 microns, which if you recall is very similar to that three micron uh, we saw from the uh, SEM image. The tortuosity is shown here, and that's basically in the long time or long uh, diffusion length limit, what the data will uh, reach. We also uh, have the explicit expression here, the dashed line goes to 1 over tau. We can overlay the 920 data with the 913 meter data. Now the 913 are the open symbols, where the blue is the decane, red is the methane. And you notice that we get um, slightly different fits. Okay, So the pore size for the 913 is uh, lower than for the 920. And you can see that without the fit. If you take a uh, constant diffusion length of around 10 microns, you can see that the 913 is more restricted than the 920 because the pore size is smaller for the 913. It's also clear that the tortuosity is less for the 913. And one way to understand that, uh, if we go back to those table of values, recall that the 913 had less bitumen, about half the amount of 920. And so we speculate that uh, increasing bitumen increases the amount of blocking. And when you block the light hydrocarbons, 
you get a larger tortuosity. And that explains why there's a, such a big difference in tortuosity between the two. Now, what do we uh, use this for? Well, uh, we've shown here, we show here a prediction of permeability using the modified carmen cosani equation. The equation is shown here. carmen cosani depends on permeability, depends on porosity, tortuosity, and pore throat size squared. Now, of course, the NMR gives us the pore body size, so we take the pore body size D and divide by the body throat ratio, or BTR. Now, BTR is around five uh, for, for chalks, and so we fix it to that value. So on this plot, on this cross plot, on the x-axis is the measured permeability. On the y is the predicted permeability for the 920 and 913 meter reservoir cores. And we also have the same data for the Austin chalks, not shown here, but it's in our paper. And so we see very good agreement uh, between the predicted permeability and the measured. And note that there are no empirical or scaling parameters involved in the Carmen Cosini. And so that's a great feat. And we see that the uh, prediction spans many orders of magnitude in permeability. So now let's compare the uh, traditional methods, uh, namely the Timur coats, shown by the crosses here, and the SDR method. Now the SDR method uh, has the fully water saturated data by the squares and the C10 region seen as the open symbols. The exp uh, expressions here use the default parameters for carbonates. And you can see here the expression for the timber coats, well known, and so is the expression here for the SDR. Now both the, uh, these uh, traditional uh, correlations uh, overestimate the permeability by orders of magnitude. And, um, and so we've made some big improvements here. Now, the big question is, now can we use this, uh, this prediction, this common Cosani prediction, which doesn't have any empirical parameters or scaling factors, et cetera, can we use that on log data and get a permeability log? Well, to, to uh, answer that, let's go back to the uh, first to the DT2 map. And this is what typically would be measured down hole, okay? Now, of course, down hole, we can't change the saturation of the core. So we have to get all of our information from one DT2 map. So this is again, the 920 meter uh, decane saturated. Now let's take the PADE fit, which I showed you previously as a fit of the restricted diffusion versus diffusion length. But now let's plot it as diffusion, restricted diffusion versus T2 or pore size equivalently. And this is what it looks like. So this is the PADE fit with the parameters that were uh, determined by the previous uh, fits. Okay, so in this case, we, in this PADE fit, uh, we uh, fix the diffusion length, it's five microns. And what we do here is at large T2s is equivalent to large pores, uh, which are comparable to the diffusion length of five microns, we start to see a bit of restriction here. But then as we get to smaller and smaller pores um, or smaller, shorter and shorter T2s, those pores are much less than the diffusion length. And so we get more and more restriction down all the way down to the predicted tortuosity. Okay, so what's remarkable is, well, first, uh, the, the PADE fit goes through the peak uh, by design, but it captures all of this signal with very restricted diffusion here in the light hydrocarbons region. Now, of course, this fit doesn't fit the uh, micritic water, that's expected since these PADE fit parameters come from the light hydrocarbons region alone. And uh, how does this compare to the more traditional approach of fitting uh, the PADE fit to these uh, DT2 maps? Uh, shown here, the, the method by Zielinski. So typically uh, electrical resistivity is used. Okay, so that's shown here by this formula. Now, if we take this core and saturate it with brine, 100% saturate with brine, we get a, an electrical tortuosity of 5.5. So much less than the uh, tortuosity we got from the PADE fit at conate water conditions. Now, if we use this tortuosity, uh, we overestimate the carmen Cosani by orders of magnitude. So uh, we can't use that. Okay, so this is what we would do, uh, an example of what a log would look like and how this 
uh, solid line would do would give us the pad a fit. Now let's get a bit more specific about this log case and let's show you the workflow that we would do. So we start with the core analysis. We measure DT2, as I've shown you, on the C1 and C10 saturated cores. Uh, we get restricted diffusion versus diffusion length. We fit that to the pad A fit. Uh, we get porosity naturally, but from the pad A fit, we get pore size or pore body size, tortuosity and heterogeneity length scale. We then do a simple Archie analysis where we get the cementation exponent M uh, from the well-known Archie uh, equation here. So we know porosity, we know tortuosity, we can derive M. And we know the heterogeneity LM, so we can get M and LM at each lithology from the core analysis. Next, we measure the core permeability. Okay, measure K. Now here's the uh, carmen cosane equation. So we know everything except BTR. Uh, we know K, we just measured it, porosity, pore size, tortuosity. So then we can determine the BTR. Okay, so this is actually also a method to determine BTR uh, at each lithology. So that's all the core analysis. Now let's go to the log. So in the log, we would measure DT2. Uh, we then fit restricted diffusion versus T2 to the pad A fit. Uh, we of course get a porosity. And uh, from the pad A fit, we determine pore size. Now one distinction, again, here we're using the pad A fit of restricted diffusion versus T2. And uh, whereas before in the core, we were fitting the pad A of restricted diffusion versus diffusion length. So just recall that distinction. Now on the logs, uh, we can reduce the number of free parameters in this pad A fit because we know the tortuosity, because we know porosity and M, and we know the heterogeneity length scale uh, for each lithology. So the only free parameter in the pad A fit for the logs is the pore size. Uh, apart of also, we need to know the properties of the bulk fluid for the bulk T2 and, and bulk diffusion. So once we have everything, uh, we can get our permeability log. So again, we have porosity on the log. We have pore size on the log from the DT2 map. We have a tau log, the tortuosity from cementation and porosity. And we have the body throat ratio. So we have everything we need and we get our permeability log in this uh, novel workflow. And on top of that, we can also get uh, in this workflow, the BTR and cementation at Koenig water. And so of uh, the hydrocarbon fizz. Okay, well now let me summarize the uh, results from this section. So restricted diffusion from DT2 is used to determine pore size and tortuosity in methane and decane saturated organic rich chalks. We use the modified carmen cosane equation to predict large ranges of permeability from 0.01 to 30 millidarcy without any empirical parameters, which is quite a feat in petrophysics. Uh, we then develop this workflow uh, on logs to, to get a permeability log from NMR. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Gabriela, who will discuss uh, surface roughness and pore size from diffusion T2. This work is a collaboration between Aramco and Halliburton and was recently published in the SPE journal. The primary focus is the characterization of the pore grain surface roughness and its applications in the NMR pore analysis. The additional BET surface area from nitrogen gas absorption is underestimating the pore size due to the surface roughness of the pore walls. The pore size from roughness independent measurements such as DT2 and micro CT are more relevant for permeability and capillary pressure. If we can quantify the surface roughness, we can then use it to determine the roughness corrected mean pore size from BET and the pore size distribution from NMR relaxation data. The integration of the experimentally measured surface roughness for a core to correct the BET surface relaxivity is what it is new in this study. In the fast diffusion limit, when the molecule bounces off the pore uh, walls many times before relaxing, the brownstein tar assumption is that the pores act as if they are disconnected. In this assumption, the surface relaxation depends on the surface to volume ratio, a geometric term, and surface relaxivity parameter rho, which is a function of the fluid 
surface interactions. Assuming smooth spherical pores, S over V is inversely proportional to the pore size, and the pore size distribution can then be determined from the T2 distribution, provided that the surface relaxivity is known. The standard method for determining the surface relaxivity is BET gas absorption. Another method is from the DT2 maps of the fully brine saturated cores. Here is an example of a DT2 map for Indiana limestone. Mitra showed that at short diffusion times, the diffusion coefficient is lower than the bulk molecular diffusion coefficient of the brine by a term which is proportional to the surface to volume ratio. This is known as restricted diffusion. At long diffusion times, when the diffusion length is large compared with the heterogeneity length scale of the pore space, the diffusion coefficient approaches the diffusion coefficient in the tortuosity limit, which depends on the porosity and Archie cementation exponent. A pad fit is used to interpolate between the short time and the long time behavior, and the surface relaxivity can be estimated as shown in Zielinski's paper. The pore size derived using this surface relaxivity does not depend on the surface roughness, since the coarse grain in length scale for diffusion, which is given by the diffusion length, is about 10 micrometers for water, which is much higher than the surface roughness length scale. In this example on Indiana limestone, a row of about 10 micrometers per second gives the best fit. This method for estimating the surface relaxivity and the pore size distribution only works in the case where there is restricted diffusion and the Archie exponent M is known. Here is the pore size distribution for Indiana limestone. Black dashed line is the pore size distribution using the surface relaxivity from BET. In green is the pore size distribution using the surface relaxivity from the roughness independent DT2. And in red is the pore size distribution from micro CT. The pore size uh, uh, from micro CT scan indicates that the large pore sizes are around 100 micrometer, which agrees with the large pore size from the DT2. However, it is 10 times larger than the pore size derived from BET. Therefore, by using raw BET, uh, the pore size is underestimated, and this is due to the surface roughness. Note here that the pore size distribution from CT is missing the micropores due to the insufficient uh, resolution in the CT image for this case. This illustration is showing the surface roughness effect on the pore size estimation from NMR. The standard method for estimating the surface relaxivity is BET gas absorption, where the total surface area is determined from nitrogen absorption isotherms, which together with the average T2 is used to calibrate the surface relaxivity from BET. However, when the pore grain surface is rough, ignoring this roughness underestimates the, uh, the pore size and the effect could be significant. The pore size estimated from both DT2 and micro CT is roughness independent. Now, to correct for this surface roughness effect, Rho BET is multiplied by a factor 1 plus 2R, as shown by Norton and Knight in their paper in 2016. We define the roughness corrected surface relaxivity as Rho LSEM, which is used later to determine the roughness corrected NMR pore size distribution. How do we measure the surface roughness? There are many te techniques and uh, instruments that can be used. The laser scanning confocal microscope, LSEM, gave by far the best results for our rocks. Therefore, we selected LSEM for measuring the surface roughness. On the right side is one example of a LSEM image projection acquired on Indiana limestone. And on the left is a slice through the image showing the profile of roughness variation along one direction. The presence of pores on the rock surface complicates the surface roughness determination because the length scale of a pore is significantly larger than the length scale of the features on the pore surface, on the grains on the raw, this pore size effect needs to be filtered out from the raw measurement. The filter should remove the pore size scale, but not the roughness. Here we use the Gaussian filter of length sigma 2.5 micrometer, 
black curve is the raw data, raw, uh, red is the filtered data, and blue is the difference of the two, which gives the surface roughness. To ensure that the measurements are representative, we typically acquire five symmetrical areas on the rock surface, as shown in this figure. An overall average number for the surface roughness is calculated. When the main objective is comparing the roughness values between different cores, we compare the mean value of the roughness from five different locations. However, the roughness distribution shows important information about the roughness heterogeneity, possibly capturing the presence of different texture or uh, the difference between small and large pores roughness. These are again the pore size distributions for Indiana limestones as showed in an earlier slide. Now, using the surface roughness corrective surface relaxivity, rho LSEM, which is rho BET multiplied by one plus two R, the pore size distribution is shown in blue. The peak for large pores is now at 55 micrometer, which is comparable with the large pore size estimated from uh, the roughness independence CT and DT2. Here is another example, Texas Cream Limestone. The surface relaxivity from DT2 is almost 30 micrometer per second for in the, uh, Texas Cream. The LSEM surface, surface roughness histogram and the mean value are shown here. The pore size distribution from the different methods are shown in this figure. The peak of the distribution estimated using raw BET is just under one micrometer, while the peak from CT scan is about five micrometer. And therefore, again, we see that raw BET underestimates the pore size. The pore size distribution from DT2 in green and LSEM uh, uh, in blue, agree both with the pore size peak estimated from CT. This is one more example for Guelph Dolomite. The DT2 surface relaxivity is about six micrometer per second in this case. The LSEM surface roughness histogram is in this case by model, indicating roughness heterogeneity, possibly capturing the presence of different texture and the difference between an between small pores and large pores roughness. The pore size distribution using raw BET underestimates the pore size, while the LSEM and DT2 pore size for large pores is in relatively good agreement with the CT. The discrepancy between DT2 and LSEM pore size distributions is larger than the, for the previous six, two examples, possibly due to the roughness heterogeneity that was not considered in the pore size distribution estimation. In conclusion, we selected the laser scanning confocal microscope to determine the roughness parameter R on a set of carbonate outcrops due to the overall field of view, resolution, cure artifacts, and reliability. The roughness parameter is then used to boost the BET surface relaxivity and pore size to match the roughness independent values from DT2 and micro CT. The roughness parameter is also used in Wenzel uh, contact angle formula for rough surfaces. Okay, and now for the final uh, part of this uh, webinar, the saturation profiling from EOR from spatially resolved T2 maps. This is based on a recent uh, publication, which was a collaboration between Rice University, Petronas, and Shell. The motivation for this work was well, saturation of mixed gas, oil, water, saturated core after foam flood EOR is not possible by core weight, and it's extremely challenging uh, by effluent analysis. And so imaging of 1D saturation profile is essential for determining the core end effects and the saturation fronts that we'll see. So here's an example of a uh, spatially resolved T2 map, and this is on a calibration sample. You see here, uh, below here is the doped uh, brine uh, with manganese doping to shorten this T2. And on top here is the hexadecane. So what we have here is uh, height, or Z, versus T2. And uh, 
we see a resolution of around 1.5 millimeters. Okay, that's basically set by the uh, experimental parameters. And in the instrument, we have a uniform gradient along around five centimeters. So our sampling should be around or not more than five centimeters. And when we have this type of map, what we do is put a cutoff. And so we can determine, um, basically, we can separate uh, the water phase from the oil phase by putting this cutoff um, as a function of, uh, then we have basically saturation as a function of height. And uh, more on the pulse sequences involved with all this. And actually, all the pulse sequences that we've shown you in this presentation, you can find in a nice uh, review article by Mitchell here in 2014. So here is that uh, profile uh, T2 map for a Berea sandstone. Now, this is a long 15 centimeter uh, Berea core, or six inches equivalently. Uh, this is the 100% uh, water saturated Berea. And again, if you recall, the five centimeter, basically a uniformity region of the uh, pulse field gradients. So what we have to do is measure uh, this core section wise using uh, a synchronized stepper motor. And then we stack the data to get the full uh, profile T2 along the six inch core. Okay, um, this is the same core, Berea but at irreducible water, okay, this is after primary drainage, so uh, the drainage with a uh, hexadecane, and we can put a cutoff here, we're separating uh, the doped water here, and the oil phase, okay, so again, we can get saturation as a function of height along the core. Now here's again, the same core, but then after uh, water flooding, so here it's a uh, residual oil, uh, we use now a cutoff of 156 milliseconds, again, to separate the oil from the dope brine phase. And finally, uh, we can get the profile uh, after foam injection, which is basically a surfactant plus nitrogen gas uh, foam. And what's remarkable is that uh, uh, all the previous uh, saturation profiles were uniform, but now we see clearly see that there's no oil at the inlet, okay? And we're going to use that to interpret the, the measurement. So now let's look at the same data, but uh, analyzed, if you like, uh, for saturation. And so now we have uh, the height, Z, uh, versus uh, the porosity and saturation. First, for the 100% water saturated case, so this is all water. Uh, we see a pretty uniform uh, profile of around 20 PU, 20 and a half, and then obviously 100% water saturated. What does it look like at irreducible water? So we have oil coming in here, hexadecane uh, coming in here, and here's the outlet. We now have a saturation, oil saturation of 53 saturation units, uh, and for that, that's at irreducible water. And now at residual oil, uh, we did a water flood and we're left with 35 saturation units of oil. But now the foam flood, and now if you recall that inlet, has no oil, okay? And the rest here is gas, which uh, is actually air in the core. Uh, so it has no NMR signal, but it's uh, labeled here. We label it gas and basically see no uh, oil here at the inlet. And so how does that help? Uh, how does that help understand the foam flood EOR experiment? Well, uh, this is the illustration of how to interpret that uh, no oil at the inlet um, part. And so here, this dashed line in the figure shows the solubility, uh, solubilization front. So on the left uh, of the dashed line, all the oil blobs have already been solubilized by the micelles and the oil saturation is zero. Okay, the micelles shown here. However, on the right uh, side of the dashed line, the micelles are saturated with oil and are in equilibrium with the oil blobs. Okay, so this is a very effective and very useful uh, measurement, which cannot be done without a profile image. So the results, a benchtop NMR provides a 1D saturation profile with the order of one millimeter resolution. And that one millimeter is typically also the resolution you get uh, when on a 3D MRI scan. Uh, of course, in this case, we're just doing a 1D uh, image profile. And it's very useful to do this benchtop 1D profile 
when a CT scanning is not available. The NMR saturation profile is done on this long uh, centimeter or 15 centimeter core, uh, which again, we use a synchronized stepper motor to uh, measure. And after foam flood EOR indicates a sol solubilization front around three centimeters from the core inlet. And that really shows the power of this profile. Okay, on that note, I'd like to conclude. That concludes our webinar and thank you for your attention. And uh, we look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you.